Welcome to today's webinar. So if you're just joining us, please just take a few moments, join in, and we'll be ready to start in a few moments. Okay, we will have Audrey Parham Stewart, our STEM CX representative, start us off. Audrey. Hello, my name is Audrey Parham Stewart, and I am a member of the STEM CX committee. STEM CX is dedicated to offering opportunities and exposure for students, teachers, and parents in the field of STEM. One of our goals is to prepare our children for the future and stimulate their minds. We recognize that parents are key to their success, and we have gathered some professionals to have a conversation tonight about our kids and what can be done to help them during these trying times. We are grateful for the sponsorship of our partners, Kaiser Permanente and The Family Tree. This webinar will be moderated by pediatrician and public health professional, Dr. Jackie Duje. Dr. Duje holds a master's degree in public health from John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and a medical degree from Rutgers Robert Woods Johnson Medical School. Dr. Duje's experience includes general pediatric practice, public health, policy development, health disparities, school health, and community engagement. She co-authored the American Pediatric Association's Policy on the Impact of Racism on Child and Adolescent Health, and she is the host, creator, and producer of two podcasts, What is Black and Talking About Books for kids. Tonight, we will have a conversation with professionals in the field of health, social work, and education. Our panelists will discuss how issues such as COVID-19 uncertainty, the challenges of virtual learning, and racial injustice protests have affected our kids and how parents can help them navigate this new normal. Your questions that were submitted will be addressed by our panelists. Now I will turn the program over to Dr. Duje, who will moderate for this evening. Dr. Duje. Thank you, Audrey. And it's a pleasure um, to join you all this evening. So, but before um, I introduce the panelists for this evening's webinar, I did want to let um, individuals know that the chat will be open for questions, but because we received so many wonderful questions um, during the registration process, we'll have to gather the questions that you put in the chat this evening and we'll, we'll follow up with um, answers to those questions within the next um, two weeks and they'll be posted on the STEM CX website. So let, so let me move forward and introduce our wonderful panel. Um, we have Shana McIver, who's the Director of Family Engagement of, with the Baltimore City Public Schools, Katia Stokes, the Director of Student Wholeness at Baltimore City Public Schools, Kristen A. Whiting Davis, a social worker with the Behavioral Health Operations um, at Kaiser Permanente, and Dr. Jacqueline Fulton, a pediatrician in Maryland, and Dr. Shante Woods, 
also a pediatrician um, in Maryland. So um, welcome our panelists. So I'm gonna start off with, um, with Dr. Woods. So Dr. Woods, one of the questions that we received from um, registrants was, um, with schools reopening, and if they have and they have they have an immunocompromised child, what can they do to help um, him or her find normalcy um, with the beginning of the school system? That's an excellent question. Thank you, Dr. Duje. Thank you, STEM CX. Um, you know, uh, what, there's no one one size fits all approach here with reopening of schools, and I think uh, parents have to do and make a decision that's best for them. Um, taking the immunocompromised child for specifically. Um, you know, you have to ask yourself, does your child get infections easily? Does your child perhaps have asthma or another respiratory condition such that if he or she were to fall ill with COVID-19, um, you know, would they have severe illness? And right now, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the CDC, they say overwhelmingly kids do very well when they have this uh, infection. Uh, many show no symptoms at all. Those who do show symptoms, typically they're mild. However, for the immunocompromised child, those, uh, those patients are at increased risk of getting hospitalized. And so that's where a parent has a decision to make. Um, one, what safety precautions is the school gonna take? Are they gonna be checking temperatures as kids come in? Um, whether it be hand sanitizer all, uh, throughout the school, does their child, a parent has to know their child. So is their child gonna uh, be responsible enough to, uh, and mature enough to, to wear a mask properly all throughout the day? Versus, you know what, that's too much of a risk. I, the parent, think that my child actually might do better at home and right now, July, that, that family might have to be saying, what's going to be our plan B? Fortunately, many schools are giving parents the option of, of sending their child uh, to school, those who have a hybrid, perhaps sending their child to school, or in fact, um, learning from home. And if a family is saying that, you know what, learning from home is going to be best for our child, touching base with the school system now, again, late July, to see what that curriculum is going to look like. I do uh, give parents advice that you may have to be a little patient with the schools because because this is new for all of us and so school systems and uh, they're, they're developing this curriculum right as we speak um, but we want it to be as robust as possible so that the learning that they get distance in the fall is is a little bit more comprehensive than what we received and we did our best but what they received in the spring. Thank you um, Dr. Woods. So Dr. Fulton um, another question that came from registrants from parents included um, how do how would they how will schools handle children who have anxiety? I mute myself. Thank you for inviting me. Anxiety is a normal body response, a feeling of fear or apprehension. Um, I find that in my telehealth visits that a lot of the kids are not anxious about COVID they're most anxious about the changes in their lifestyle. Um, so a parent actually needs to look at their child, how were they before COVID um, and how are they now? So if you're seeing major changes in your child being anxious, then that's something that you need to address during the summer and not wait till school starts and maybe have to reach out and get some assistance or help for your children. You can. Um, have them um, interact more with kids their own age, um, whether virtually or socially distance um, events with their, their actual friends. Um, I think, as I said, I think most of the anxiety with kids now have to do with um, being cooped up in the house, um, not being able to go where uh, they used to go, the mall, um, um, not being able to play basketball with their friends because they're their parents are anxious. So I think that you need to set some sort of a structure so that their days are pretty routine um, and make sure that you are talking to your child and finding out what is that child anxious about. But like I said, most, most kids who are anxious right now are anxious about their lifestyle, but you need to know your child. If your child is extremely anxious, excessively anxious, you're seeing changes in their behavior, they're becoming more agitated, conduct problems along with the anxiety, then you need to reach out to your pediatrician, to your church, um, to your family, and ultimately maybe to a therapist for your child before school starts. So Katia, along those lines, right, um, how, what, what, are, what are schools gonna, what are, what are Baltimore City Public Schools, what, are, what will be in place for um, addressing um, social and emotional needs um, for, for kids that are returning to school? 
Absolutely, great question. Hello, everyone. Uh, so in Baltimore City Public Schools, we are really working to make sure we have a wraparound approach for both students and families, as well as for our teachers. So for students, we have um, put out guidance around scheduling for schools so that at each grade level, there's an opportunity for students to engage in small group sessions around social emotional support. So for example, that can look like having a morning meeting as well as a close to the day. In Baltimore City, we're calling it a welcoming ritual where students will be able to experience having the opportunity to have a conversation about how might I be feeling today? Um, what is it that I might need in order to make it through today? And then for the end of the day, we're gonna have all schools engage in what we're calling an optimistic closure and being able to really just reflect on the day and how its students experience the day. So we're really thinking about that as a space for students to one, just connect, right? So um, we know that that transition to the virtual space with having to do several sessions, asynchronous sessions, uh, not asynchronous sessions, I'm sorry, I apologize, synchronous sessions back to back of instruction. We wanna make sure that we are building in opportunities for those transitions and breaks. And so for us, we're really committed to making sure we're starting off the day where we might engage in a little bit of mindfulness, ending the day with a little bit of mindfulness. So really incorporating opportunities to really practice strategies that will help with dealing with our emotions and processing and just how we are experiencing. Um, as Dr. Fulton said, just that transition of not having the same traditions or the experiences of going to school um, and making sure they have that opportunity to connect socially, although they might be physically distant. We also are really making sure we're having a robust approach to making sure that our school-based supports are available. So our social workers, our psychologists, all of our expanded mental health providers are available, making sure that those teams are meeting weekly as teachers may be finding that students uh, may be experiencing or expressing some concern those schools teams will be meeting weekly to make sure they're able to have those conversations reach out to families as need be and make sure there is support just as in the spring we will also make sure that we have a helpline for parents to be able to call in if they are in need of support all social workers at the school have a google number so that they can be accessed and reached um, in the event that parents reach out and say, hey, I'm noticing this change about my child or even the teachers mm -hmm. may notice this change as well. So we're really making sure that um, students are able to really engage socially and really have that space to reflect and have conversations about how they just are experiencing this time. Thank you so much, Katia. So yeah. Kristen, along those same lines uh, regarding um, mental health supports in school, Katia, you know, share there's going to be a helpline, um, what, um, what some of the mental health staff at the schools will be doing, but are there any additional um, mental health supports and resources out there for families? Of course, it might be on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No um, yeah, I think that there's a couple factors, of course, depending upon if you're just looking for general support, you know, there's lots of resources in the communities and given that specific community depends upon what those resources are. You know, one of the sponsors is the Family Tree and like I said, they have lots of, you know, resources for parental help and, and, and hotlines, but also within the community, whether it be, you know, through your church or through, you know, some of the other agencies. And like I said, the schools obviously have got a lot of things going on as well to help support families. Now, if you're getting into mental health specific, you know, a lot of families have to go through their insurance provider. And so, like I said, for, you know, I'm a representative of Kaiser. And so for Kaiser members, we offer lots of different supports from classes to group therapy to individual therapy um, in, in a variety of ways. And then of course, you know, if you need to go that route, checking with your pediatrician for those um, providers in your area. Again, if you're looking for specific mental health therapy services, but you know, with the COVID and all the virtual, there's so many resources online that families can access. I know 
um, one of the, the departments of mental health. They have a lot of resources. I actually, um, the behavioral health systems in Baltimore has a number of resources for COVID um, specific transitions for kids and for families. So um, there are lots of things out there for people to access. It's just a matter of kind of tracking them down and seeing what fits for you and your family and your child. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, so Shana, if you could elaborate a little bit more about um, additional things Baltimore City Public Schools are doing um, to support parents, children, and families um, during um, the upcoming school year regarding COVID-19. Sure, Dr. G, Dr. D. First of all, I want to say thank you. Um, it is an honor to be a part of this uh, learning opportunity for families. Um, appreciate the opportunity to share with parents what we're doing in city schools. So first I say thank you to our families, right, for helping us make some very important decisions regarding reopening. Um, families have been super responsive to our request for input and feedback, which truly helps to inform our decision, decisions around reopening, as well as allows us to plan supports for them moving forward. Um, we've heard from you all. We will continue to keep you all in the loop and, in, and as engaged as possible um, to help us determine what's best for your children and getting your children back to school in person um, when it's safe to do so. To help families adapt to our new normal, we have and will continue to offer trainings, uh, toolkits, as Katia mentioned, access to not just the social and emotional hotlines, but academic support, homework support hotlines as well. Um, and other ongoing opportunities for parents and caregivers to build their muscle and capacity to support their students' academic success and wholeness. We can't educate our students without strong family school partnerships. It's a non-negotiable, that, that, that is a must. Our families can count on city schools to offer, to continue to offer access to food and technology. Uh, we'll also host a virtual citywide back to school night. And in a nutshell, that's an orientation to help guide our families through the use of the technology, the various teaching platforms that we will be using. Um, and just to gain a better understanding of what students should be learning and how parents should assess the progress of their students and how to create um, home learning spaces that are conducive, conducive to academic success for their students. Um, our families can also depend on us to ramp up, scale up in the areas of two-way communication, um, targeting families, uh, providing information that's culturally relevant and just very practical that our families can understand. Um, I mentioned various training opportunities. Those training opportunities will be connected and linked to um, literacy outcomes, social, emotional, and, and wholeness, and more through what we're calling our parent university. And that's for students um, who are our, our, our primary focus. Our teaching and learning team is working really, really hard to ensure that teachers are ready and that students have access to great appropriate content as soon as school starts and that all students are engaged in personalized teaching to help recover and extend learning. So Shannon, just as a follow-up to that, um, mm -hmm. parents have asked, what, in addition to those supports that are, will be there once they go to school, what additional supports will laptops, what laptops will be provided? Um, what other things will be provided by the school system in order to engage those students that, may, that will be doing virtual, um, attending schools virtually? Thank you. Um, that is our goal to ensure that every city school's child has a laptop, has a device, has a hotspot access to the internet. Um, staff are working dil diligently to determine the need because we know that there is still need. Um, we've served, I believe, over 13,000 um, families uh, with laptops, um, excuse me, with Chromebook devices and hotspots just this week alone, yesterday. Um, 1,078 laptops were distributed um, and about 500 um, hotspots roughly. So that's just to give you an idea of um, first the need and how, how, uh, how much the, the demand is, right, uh, for the devices. And we know that we have families that have needs. All schools have been charged with 
contacting, finding all of their families and assessing the need further. We have community partners that will help us do this as well. So our, our goal is to ensure that every student who needs a computer, um, that we're supporting them and helping them um, to get that and, and access internet. I will add that families of students who attend charter schools um, should um, connect with their schools, points of contact, uh, school secretaries to see how they get devices. But right now on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, a family between 10 and six a family could come to uh, the district to receive their device and hotspot. And we're using social distancing practices and staff um, are using proper PPE and we ask that families do the same to ensure that everybody gets what they need. So that students are set up for success in the fall. Excellent. So Dr. Woods and Dr. Fulton, I wanted to um, ask you some of these, uh, the other, some other questions. I'm just gonna kind of put them together in terms of thematic, you know, the themes. You know, there are parents who are concerned, you know, Dr. Woods shared earlier about, um, you know, children who may be immunocompromised, but there's still, but there's still other, qu other questions parents have about the health and well-being of their, of their students attending school um, amidst COVID-19 and what they can do to keep their kids safe. Um, and also if you could address a little bit more about um, the roles that schools play in terms of also the fear, right? Some, some kids have fears about COVID-19. So how can, we, how can parents help reassure their, their kids and also discuss about how schools are, are working, um, even with pediatricians, right? As, as um, Shana mentioned, those community partnerships, with, which also include working with um, um, pediatricians. So I'll ask Absolutely. Dr. Woods if you, can, if you can answer, and then I'm in Dr. Fulton. Thank you very much. I was actually, out of deference, going to allow my mentor, Dr. Fulton, to go first, but I, I, I'll get started. Um, so let's address um, fear, for example, um, that children might have in going back to school. Not only children, but, you know, children have the fear. Some children have fear. I agree with Dr. Fulton. You don't have too many kids saying, you know, I'm scared of COVID, right? Um, but that's a certain age group. That's probably the invincible uh, preteens and, and older. Um, perhaps the, uh, let's say, school age, true school age child that we think of. So let's say, you know, five to 11 year old whose uh, aunt or uncle or even grandparent, uh, they might actually have fear about COVID. And so what, what we do, what we recommend is actually talking to your child, um, being open. First, we like to say, start off and see what they know see what they've heard, because they may have heard something from a cousin that might be accurate or more likely inaccurate. Um, perhaps they're on social media, shouldn't be, but perhaps they're on social media, saw something, saw something on TikTok, heard something on the news. Um, so first we like to assess what they actually know. Um, and then let's be honest, let's address their fears, ask them why they think that. And then third, as a parent or as a teacher, our, our job is to, to reassure, to provide safety, to provide structure. And so that accurate information would be, in my opinion, so, so this, this COVID-19 virus, it is a new virus and we are still learning about it, but fortunately we have some very smart people on the case, doctors, scientists, engineers that coming up with medicines, coming up with vaccines, very brilliant teachers and principals, school administrators, social workers who are going to put together a plan so that we can safely return because we know that children do learn best in the school setting. Now this isn't Dr. Wood saying that all kids should go back. I think it's a little more nuanced than that. However, I do support that kids learn best with structure. And if one were to ask me, is there more structure at home or in school? I think we all know the answer to that, a little more structure in school. So we do think that school is a better learning environment. So that's how I would suggest how we address children's fear. And again, we talked a little bit earlier about parents' fear. Talking about the safety aspect, how we keep our kids safe, um, it's modeling good behavior. And I think that starts right now in July. So again, proper mask wearing. I promise you today, today, my son who's four, he's starting pre-K in the fall and it looks like they're gonna be in session. He goes to a real small school. Today was his first day of wearing a mask. So he's in daycare now and school starts in about a month. So we put a, day, uh, uh, a face mask on him just to see how he would do. See if he's gonna be touching his eyes and his nose and his mouth all day long or if he's just gonna put it there and leave it there. And the daycare provider actually gave me a surprising report that he actually did quite well. He did pull it down and was wearing it like a little chin guard, but that's to be expected. So now we got something to build upon. So that's just a small little step that we took today. 
good hand wash and hand sanitizer. Sure, school's going to have some, but I'm going to make sure it's about 30 more bottles in his book bag so that he knows every so often, look, hit that hand sanitizer, <laughs> things like that. To tell him that no swapping should take place, right? So, so I saw this interesting, um, uh, I think it was actually like a screenshot or a meme, but it said, you'll send your kid to school with a PJ mask mask and then he's gonna come home with a spider-man mask that he traded and it's like oh my goodness right <laughs> so telling them you know no trading should take place so modeling good behaviors and i think now is the time to start again i'm gonna pass it over to my mentor dr folk um just sitting here thinking one of the things my daughter's a uh, pre-k teacher in baltimore city public schools and i sort of had her walk me through her day um and what we were looking at was the fact that the pre-K through maybe second graders are the ones that will struggle with social distancing and hand sanitizers and not running up to the teacher and or hugging their friends. So, um, and we were looking at what the, what the needs may be. And we were saying, you know, kids need about five masks a week because we're asking parents to wash the mask and dry the mask. And I don't know about most parents, I don't know if I would be doing every night washing a mask, especially if I have more than one kid. So that's something that we as a community can look at um, and encourage, even in our offices. Do you have enough masks when school starts in October, ultimately? Um, we can also partner with the schools to see, do they have enough hand sanitizer? And um, teach kids how to wipe stuff down because a pre, apparently a pre-K kid up to second grade, they can wipe their own desk down. They can sanitize their own little areas because quite frankly, we know that the resources are not there on a good day in the school system. So we can teach our kids how to sanitize something, how to wipe their, and ha have them understand that I need to leave my space clean. I need to be in a clean space. Uh, I need to know how to wear my mask. I need to remind my mommy or daddy to wash my mask. So social distancing is important. Um, I was looking at an article in the Washington Post this last week where Europe, we're looking at Europe opening their schools and um, they basically social distancing and mask and hand sanitizers kind of fell by the wayside. Um, they did very well initially, but it kind of fell by the wayside and they have done pretty good opening their schools um, without the cases of COVID going up. I'm not saying that we should not encourage that, but I think that if we can get our kids to help out initially when they first start school and get in the habit day one of school that we're going to stand on this little dot and that dot and, and, and I'm going to wipe down and I can't bring somebody else's mask home and I can't share um, anything with my classmates. Um, and the other thing I, I think too is we need to look at who needs to be tested. Um, as a physician, I think that I personally feel that we need to test teachers right now. So if, if teachers are positive right now, then they have what two weeks of quarantine that'll push you into aug end of August, and then you got to retest them again, and it's taken two what a week to get a, re a test result back. So if we just did that with pre-K through second grade, then maybe by October we'll be truly ready to know um, which teachers are available to teach um, and even look at testing the pre-K through second grade kids. So um, that, that's my thought about starting school. Thank you so much, Dr. Fulton and Dr. Woods. Mm -hmm. so, so we're talking a little bit about pre-K and second graders, right? Pre-K through second grade. So Katia, I wanna sort of, um, address the question that came up around for that for that age group. Um, so a mom asked that you know her child has been you know used to doing you know worksheets um, during you know during the spring the during the spring um, before schools went out and now now their child hates doing the worksheets right. Um, so how do we how do how do we help parents address burnout? And the reverse negativity toward classroom at classwork at home that resulted from the experience um, last semester, right? And how do we also help parents with the stress and frustration um, moving forward? Yes, great question. You know, to parents, the the first thing that I would say is to always give yourself grace, right? So we know that we are at home trying to balance 
life, work, the adjustments for students. And so the very first thing for not just parents, but for students as well, is for us to all just be patient with this. And I like to always think about how can we be patient and then how can we turn this into a fun experience or routine at home, right? So we can't change the circumstance, but we can certainly give a little bit of voice or a narrative or choice in how we experience it. What students will remember is how did I experience this time? So when I think about homework, one of the first things, when, especially when I was a teacher, it used to work. A little trick I would do, instead of calling it homework, I would call it home fun. It's amazing how it works. Try it out. So home fun. And so then along with this home fun space, I would even say, take the time to even really, as you prepare for school, Think about how students used to love preparing for back to school, getting a book bag, getting school supplies. Why those things don't have to change. Now you may not get a book bag, but why can't we create a home fun space at home, right? And so we can take the time to decorate it, make it look nice and neat, get nice supplies there, just like, again, that routine, as we said earlier, that routine and that structure, right? That's also supporting their social and emotional well-being and the adjustment piece to getting used to working in the virtual space, building in that routine. So having the home fun space, creating it, I would even say make sure there are things that are there that are really calming and relaxing for your child. Um, along with that, I would even say, you know, I always believe in connect with what works with your child. I have not admittedly done a TikTok video yet, but they are fun, right? And so there are fun ways that at home that we can take some of that content that's on that worksheet and together, let's take, let's create a TikTok video about it. There are fun videos online, um, whether it is that goes over content, they may introduce it in music, they may introduce it through videos, take the time to supplement that content in that way. But as we also said earlier, make sure that there is like a structure, right? So space and time. We are really making sure that in city schools, we are really thinking about one screen time for students. So if you have not had an opportunity to view the video from yesterday's board's meet, board meeting, we did share a proposed schedule and you'll see that across the grade bands, there is an increase in screen time. So we're really thinking about what is age appropriate and best for students to be on screen time. We're also talking about how do we build in those breaks. So student parents can also utilize that same process. I like to think about 20 minutes of work or 15, 20 minutes of work and then give myself five or 10 minutes of break, right? Making sure we're building in sort of that type of pattern for, um, for students. Um, I, for middle and high school students, I think about what about safe, socially distanced study dates. So you might have students come, maybe they're able to sit six feet apart on the porch, or maybe there are churches that are willing to open and, and assist with that and have small groups come and study together. Any of those opportunities like that for those social connections to also help would be great. And then for the adults, again, going back to what we said about just modeling, how to handle and to manage, we're all really working through how do I balance my time? And it's okay. It happens. We get a little frustrated, but it's important for students to see or our children to see. So how did my mommy or my daddy or my grandma or my aunt or my cousin, whoever, how did they just handle that? And then just being able to honestly say, you know, I'm struggling today. Again, building those opportunities to build that emotional vocabulary, getting comfortable with being able to share and say, this is where I am today and this is what I need, I think will be great for adjusting to, to working at home and, and, and adjusting to figuring out home fun and the home space at home. So I like that term, homework fun. <laughs> well, take the workout, just home fun. Home fun. <laughs> right, I, I like that home fun. So my, yeah, I have college students going back, so I'll tell them about the home fun. All right, so Kristen, I just wanted to, um, to follow up on um, Katia's great, great advice. So she talked about how to make um, the day-to-day the -day school, you know, home fun. But when kids are ready for the downtime and for playing, what are some, some ways and ideas for safe um, social distancing play dates or for kids to have fun?
then Kristen's on mute again. <laughs> it's in the wrong place. I'm used to a different screen. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of options, but you do have to get creative in your, your downtime. Um, and so sometimes I think as parents and, you know, adults, we can help our kids figure out things to do. Um, so whether that's, you know, more movement in the home, you know, playing games. I know I'm a big puzzle. Uh, I like to do jigsaw puzzles. So I'm doing a lot of puzzles, board games. I played a lot of board games with my boys, card games. You know, there's a lot of those type of activities, arts and crafts, if your kids, you know, is an arts and craftsy person, there's a lot of those kind of activities that we can do at home. Now, I'm also a big outdoors person, so I'm a big go out and hike and walk and get outside and enjoy nature. And like I said, that's a very grounding, um, a very mindful way to spend your time. Um, and again, I think that that can balance out some of the screen time. Um, you know, because we are on screens a lot, you know, professionally we're on screens now. Our kids are not only, you know, playing video games on screen, but now school's on a screen. So to have those opportunities to disconnect from those screens, as, as wonderful as they are at times, but to have that opportunity to just get away from that, I think is valuable for all of us um, and making sure that, that we're putting those efforts into play um to kind of make those things happen i mean there's a lot of things that, that you can do for fun at home and i think you have to be mindful of your child's interests you know whether it's a TikTok video or you know i my sons like to do legos so whether it's playing with something creative like that to kind of give your brain a break i think is really important so so Shana, we talked a, you know, we talked a little bit about um, Baltimore City Public Schools plans for reopening. I was wondering if you could touch base on what is being done um, by private schools, if you're aware, um, to assure um, safety for students. Well, not so much. I'm not as familiar with, about what's being done for private schools, but I can share with you what city schools is doing and, and can take it into consideration to determine um, that schools are ready to go and safe for families. Um, I start by saying that to parents that your child, your children's well-being is our number one priority. Um, we're going to do our very best to maintain their safety and health. Now the academic success of the students and their ability to thrive must also be a critical area of focus. So I know that our families have very different circumstances and experiences. So we really do aim to provide families with choices um, as, as best possible and, and as much as we can. So our planning teams and facilities office um, are consulting local and national health and educational experts to make final decisions regarding the return to school um, in the fall. So we will reassess, I believe, by October the 16th or mid-October, we'll reassess our readiness to return to school um, and ensure that our uh, that we have the appropriate training for school-based staff and guidance and protocols are developed for schools to make this a smooth process for everyone. Um, for example, there will be, what has been proposed, right, is that there'll be uh, space plans that schools have to create. So schools will have to assess their, the spaces where students will be. They'll have to determine what the plan will be that will be submit, submitted to the experts um, and, a, and a plan would need to be approved. And so there's several measures and layers to what the process would look like um, to ensure that all the safety measures are in place. Um, so there's no, I would imagine there's no question that intensified cleaning protocols will be put in place and extra safety measures like um, temperature checks during arrival, checking for face coverings and ensuring that hand cleaning is taking place. All of those will be mandatory practices. So these are just some examples of the recommendations that have been made by, you know, content owners at city schools. Um, and city schools is just, again, constantly working um, and, and trying to determine and, and create the best strategy to make sure that all of our children are safe. And that can't happen without the input of families. I think um, I'd be remiss if I did not mention uh, the efforts that we put in play to hear from families about what their concerns were, what they thought um, 
would be necessary and what were like non-negotiables for them to come back to school. So we've done focus groups. We've um, put out surveys where we had over 18,000 parents respond to. We've done empathy interviews where we were what, we, what we've called virtual family listening tours. And we've asked families, what are your concerns? And folks have bubbled up things like, um, I have a child with a compromised immune system, or I'm just afraid because my little one is so small, I'm not sure that he or she is ready um, to, to be responsible enough to maybe keep the face mask. So all of those things are being taken into consideration. We've done focus group discussions and so on. So we will continue to do that to ensure that um, safety comes first. So Dr. Woods, given um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and also this past summer, the heightened visibility of racism. Can you, so I'm asking this question because we talked about um, a, lot of what, a lot of resources for children regarding COVID, but again, just wanna switch gears a little bit for what supports and resources are available to parents um, given COVID-19 and adjusting to the, to the start, of, you know, start of a new school, school year, but also knowing um, some of the some of the heightened the heightened visibility of racism that's also been brought up um, this summer. What are some some thoughts about how parents can help? Um, how we can better help parents address these stressor, stressors? Well, I would start off by telling them to get the acclaimed book by Dr. Duje and for them to read uh, to read your work to see how to best address racism in in the pediatric population. Um, uh, I think something we mentioned earlier in terms of assessing children's fears related to COVID is actually uh, be open, be honest, and see what they know. Um, so when it comes to racism, I think we have to do the same thing. Be open, be honest, and see what they know. Uh, we think uh, developmentally children uh, are able to pick apart uh, or at least tell differences in, in skin color as early as six months. Um, and we think as early as five years of age, uh, children are able to interpret fair and not fair um, and, and treatment and, you know, if someone's been treated differently or, or hey, I didn't get the same, uh, I don't know what kids eat, um, hot Cheetos and Takis. I didn't get the same amount of hot Cheetos on my plate that my, you know, that my brother got. Um, so as it pertains to racism, parents should see what do you know, um, assess what their child knows. I think parents should uh, take early opportunities, I think the earlier the better, to uh, highlight the, the, the differences that children have or that people have uh, to embrace them and to welcome them. An example might be of reading a, a children's book before your baby goes to sleep. Um, and it's, uh, you know, hopefully a diverse book and it shows multiple skin tones. Uh, a parent complimenting a child of another race's uh, hairstyle. Oh, look at this beautiful hairstyle that this baby has. Um, what that does is it makes the child open to embracing differences and, and embracing different cultures. However, you know, some parents say, well, no, I don't want to get into that. It's a sticky subject. Uh, you know, it's a slippery slope. It's important because with race actually is safety and as pediatricians, as teachers, as social workers, um, our, our safety is, our, is paramount. And so for me specifically, I'm going to jump age groups now. I'm going to go to my, my young black men specifically. When they come for my visit, for my adolescent visit, I like to ask a lot of questions. Hey, who do you roll with? How are your friends? I know you're a good kid. You come to me once a year. I know your family. But who do you hang around? Are you on the corner with them when they're on the corner? Do you have any friends that sell weed? Like I was a good kid, decent grades, straight A's, poly, but I have friends who sold weed. Am I hanging around my friends who sell weed such that if the police roll up on them or if the rival gang rolls up on them for selling them some bad dope, you know, now am I at risk? It's a safety issue. So what's the point? One, parents need to be open, be honest. Two, see what your kids know. Three, appreciate that it's safety. And then four, probably the biggest thing, starting early and having your children embrace differences, I think is most important. So I just want to follow up on um, your discussion, your work with um, young black men. And if you heard or talk, had conversations with parents or your patients about the impact of um, the George Floyd's murder, um, the protest, and how you help, um, help them address those concerns and issues. 
Sure. George Floyd for many young men today, many young black men today was, was my Rodney King. And so I, I'm, I'm, hate to say this, I'm 40. I just turned 40, um, getting old. And, and so when I was a teenager, Rodney King was taking place. And this was a, an atrocity that took place, caught on camera, and officers were found not guilty. And subsequently, um, you know, riots ensued throughout the country. Um, this was an opportunity, at least I'm saying Rodney King, wow, that was a uh, disjustice done or a misjustice done to a person of color, a black man, um, and no one sees that as being wrong. Like the, the justice system that's supposed to protect us doesn't see that as being wrong. And this was an atrocity committed by those who are supposed to protect and serve. So many similarities with George Floyd. Now, what one can say is officers have been arrested. You know, there's pending litigation, so we shall see what happens. But there are too many cases where nothing has been done. And so I think it's important for us caregivers, providers, to embrace young Black men and all people of color, but specifically young Black men, to say, you matter. What is happening is not OK. And we are here to stand up. One of the things I want to compliment and say that something I see now that didn't quite happen with Rodney King is that there are there's a lot of involvement right now. And probably that hesitation to me claiming 40 is because the youth movement right now is so strong. I think I want to be a part of that. It's so strong that it is galvanizing a lot of people, all races, to say, wait a minute, we need to do something about it. And to hear um, John Lewis, I think he said right now is reminiscent of when the civil rights movement was for him, the energy, the momentum that's there. And so I'm excited, but I think it's important for us to let young black men know you matter. I think it's also important for us to let young black men know for their safety. And this is just something that I feel is very important. We've all had that conversation 10 and two. So if our young black men get pulled over 10 and two, if they get stopped, be respectful. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. So that they can make it out of that situation and then tell one of us, someone, an advocate, that we have some work to do to, you know, stand up for them. So it is, again, and to me, it's not a slippery slope conversation. I'm going right, I'm diving right into it. But I think it's a conversation that we need to, to all have. And I hope that as we get back into the schools, um, because this has happened, you know, since schools let out, that all colors can have this conversation with our young black men. I know it's happened already on some fronts, but I think now more globally, I think this is a conversation that all races can, can talk to our young men, young black men. Hey, how do you feel? You know, how did this affect you? So on and so forth. Thank you so much, Dr. Woods. So Dr. Fulton, I'm gonna pivot a little bit um, and ask about how do, how do parents of children with neuro, that are, that are neurodiverse, you know, they may have um, been diagnosed with dyslexia, autism, AD, attention deficit disorder, dyspraxia, or other neurologic conditions. How can we help parents prepare their kids entering school? Um, I think we pretty much have spoke to that. Um, all kids need structure. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they have disabilities or not. I think setting up that safe workspace that Ms. Stokes spoke about um, and making sure that that's fun and knowing what your child's limitations are, having, um, um, having a structure to the day um, with breaks is very important. Um, and especially reaching out to the school because these kids have had these problems prior to COVID and prior to going to virtual learning. So um, parents should have some sort of a resource at their child's school that they can reach out to and help them set up their, um, their learning plan for that child. Um, I think it's important to maybe have a morning huddle every day where you're gonna map out um, sort of a structured day for the child, watching a child to see whether or not they become distracted and pulling back and letting them have a free period of time. Um, so that they're not um, acting out. Um, and this is really for all kids. Um, I, I can't imagine going to school virtually. Um, so I, I think that for all kids the same, it's a matter of what are the child's needs. And it sounds like the school system's looking out for all kids. Um, so I think that just to reach out, I don't know if the schools are open now for parents to sort of start getting ready um, for kids that have, um, have learning disabilities, but um, 
I think the main thing is to set that workspace up and start the child with a routine right now in the summertime so they're ready when, when school starts. Um, and to try to let the child help with the structure, with the schedule, um, and realizing that the school is your backup. You have um, family members you may be able to reach out to, grandparents who may understand the math better than you understand the math, or, um, or actually younger folks who <laughs> understand the math better than you understand the math. And so you can kind of get them on the phone or do a little FaceTime with them to see if they can, they can help you out with the children's learning and, and utilize the um, older siblings, let the siblings help their siblings because they know each other. Um, so I think that um, at the end of that week, look back and see what worked and what didn't work. Um, and then maybe reach out to the school because that week didn't work out so well. And what can we do next week to, to make next week better for the child? So like I said, I don't think that it's much different for any child, it's just that you have to know what your child's needs are and reach out to the school for help. Dr. Like Fulton, I want to follow up, because um, as, as you were talking, um, as, you were, as you were mentioning, all, school, all children need structure, and Katia talked about you know, creating home fun. What about those kids who are missing their friends? Like, what, what are your recommendations as a pediatrician for um, helping kids who are missing their friends? Um. I think all of us are missing folks. And I think that we all need to be honest about all of us missing our, our previous life um, and let the child help with planning fun. Um, what, who, who do they really miss? I mean, kids don't miss everybody. I mean, who are they really missing? Um, can you set up some sort of a social situation where maybe they can social distance and they can meet and they can eat, but they're 10 feet apart? in a park. Um, kids need to get out. I found that a lot of parents, um, one of the misunderstandings about COVID is it's in the air. So they haven't been letting their kids go outside. They've been really truly in the house. So they don't go for walks. Um, so I think that they need to get out. They need to help let the kids help plan their fun and um, make sure that they're a actually able to interface with folks, um, not just virtually, but in settings that are safe for both kids and the parents. And Katia, there are going to be a lot of new students, right? So new pre-Kers, new kindergarten, new kindergartners, and so so therefore new parents new to the to the school system. What are what are recommendations or supports for? Um, parents who are having um, their kids, new, you know, there'll be a, this will be a new process for them, um, virtual learning, um, and just getting getting acclimated to to this new new environment, this new school environment. Yes, absolutely. Um, I th one of the things for especially parents here for um, from city schools, we are really being intentional about making sure that we are building in times for office hours, so that te parents can be able to contact reach out to teachers, have conversations about what it is that I need to make sure that my child is able to adjust. Um, as Shana said earlier, um, we're thinking about what well, we are planning to have the virtual back to school night. Some of the things that we are planning to do from the social emotional office is creating videos ahead of time that speaks just to that. So how can we prepare for back to school and having little videos that help, helps with tips and strategies? So parents can follow those um, tips and strategies as well. Um, I would really think that, again, thinking about uh, for our younger ones, beginning to think about that routine. What are some of the routines that our students or our children would really like when we're starting to go back to school? Thinking about sleep schedule before we start, you know, during the summer, typically, you know, we might stay up a little longer, hang out a little longer, but certainly now having such a long period of time with just disruption in schedules, really thinking about what are some, what are those things that I want to make sure health-wise I'm still giving, so making sure that we are sleeping well, making sure we're paying attention to what it is that our children are eating. So I think those are just a couple of simple things that parents who are new to this, 
and their students might be new to, new to school. I would also offer, again, as Shana said, using this as an opportunity to reach out to us and to schools to give ideas. You know, like what would be great for students or for children to be able to see if the teacher is going to have a certain virtual background up, being able to have just like an open house and come in to see that virtual background, practicing what is it like to sign on to my virtual platform, uh, parents actually practicing getting on that virtual platform as well ahead of time, and then utilizing our ITD support being available to make sure that any parents that may be experiencing some tech difficulties with getting online, making sure that you're able to connect with them and also access what Google has started to put out just mini videos about how do you get online and access. So utilizing any of those great resources, I think are great ways to begin to prepare for that transition to virtual. Thank you so much. And Shana, there have been a couple questions about um, children that are interested in healthcare careers or you know just opportunities to to engage in um, activities outside of school whether it be sports or just achieving their their vision and what's what supports or resources or how can families learn more about um, achieving their goals or or ideas that they want to pursue like healthcare a healthcare career well, uh, Dr. D, I think probably our healthcare professionals probably may be able to answer or lend some um, support in answering that question. But I'd say for, um, in regards to just in general, helping parents um, help their children's dreams come to fruition, right? That is the job of the Family and Community Engagement Office, right? We know that every parent, regardless of their uh, educational attainment, income, wants what's best for their children. Right? And so it is our job to give families the skills um, to help build their skill rather um, and tap into their funds of knowledge because we know that they do have it, right? And they can help and teach us a, a thing or two about children. Um, but to create the spaces for families so that they are supporting and co-teaching with with, with, their, um, with the educators, right? It is our theory of action that if we build trusting relationships with families and allow them opportunities to um, to participate in decision making and the actual uh, learning and teaching of their children, then that will yield academic success for our young people, right? And so the engagement office partners, for example, with offices like um, Katia's office and wholeness and with our teaching and learning office to make sure that we are creating um, as many learning opportunities and supportive um, documents and toolkits so that our families can access, right? Our families to include our ELL and newcomer population, making sure that we are translating um, documents and important messaging for those families so that they too can participate um, in, in their child's education. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna follow up um, for our last, um, last question um, and get Dr. Woods and Dr. Fulton's uh, response. So we talk about health and safety and well-being, right? What the schools are doing, um, how to support families. But as pediatricians, right, I wanted to talk to you about the importance of making sure that, you know, we talk to parents about um, preparing for school, but not but preparing for school, but to be healthy. Um, immunizations, for example, what immunizations? Um, why they're important, especially coming up with the flu with the flu season. If you could talk to that for parents. Sure. So you hit the nail on the head that um, there are other aspects to health besides COVID-19 um, and safety from COVID-19. Let's start with vac vaccinations. Um, we think children now more than ever, children need to be vaccinated because we see the importance of vaccines preventing disease. Um, so something I think is going to be really important going forward with this season coming up is going to be a flu vaccine. Um, I'll probably, as a, as, a, as a provider, be a little bit more strict with recommending a flu vaccination. Before, uh, there were certain age groups, immunocompromised, under two, I would twist parents' arm. If they were a little older than that, I didn't have time to be fighting back and forth and hear their conspiracy theories. But this year, I might actually say, no, I think you really need to get your flu shot, only because the symptoms of flu, the symptoms of COVID, they're so similar. Uh, besides this loss of taste and smell, it's almost like the same symptoms. And so if kids start rolling up in school 
with flu with the flu, but it looks like COVID and we're not sure and we were relying on flu tests, it's gonna be a whole hot mess. So getting your routine school vaccinations, measles, mumps, rubella, vac, uh, varicella, but then also to include the flu shot. Nutrition, nutrition is so healthy. What we put in our bodies is what's gonna set us up. Probably even more so, more important than vaccines is the foods that we're eating. One thing about COVID is that this has been a nice reset, I believe, from the spring till now. I see more people being active, working out, and I think, again, healthy modeling from the parents and from older siblings, healthy modeling will be really important. Good nutrition, working out, get your vaccines. I think that'll set us up for success going forward into the fall. All right, awesome. And Dr. Fulton, I didn't know if you had any additional um, work. I know we're ending uh, close to ending, but um, just looking at the vaccine schedule. So your four-year-olds need to be immunized. So they should be immunized by four years old. So they hit that door, they should be fully immunized. Your 11 and 12-year-olds are some shots around that age again. And then again, it's 16 years old. So if you have kids around that age, look at the immunization records, reach out to your pediatrician. A lot of us have modified our office hours, but we are definitely available to get those shots in. So I want to thank I want to thank our wonderful panelists um, for this evening. Our time is up, um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, um, STEM CX, the Family Tree, and Kaiser Permanente for bringing us all together uh, for this very important conversation. For those who are who, who are attendees, please um, complete the post event survey that you'll receive. And we want to thank you all for joining and have a great evening and stay well.